we go. Great. Welcome to our second session of our Catalog of Open Infrastructure Services question and answer session. Um, my name is Caitlin Thaney, the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure, joined by my colleague Richard Dunks, our Director of Research and Strategy. Um, you'll also see on this title slide, Emmy Sang, which, who's our engagement lead, um, who joined for our first call and is based in a time zone that this is an unfriendly time for. Um, the aims for um, today's call are really just to provide a space for a broader discussion about the next steps and what we're thinking for um, COIS as we refer to it, and also open the floor for, for broader questions. Um, Richard, if you'd go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of some logistics, there we have a shared notes document for both sessions. You can see the questions and our responses from those from the first session, if you'd like. Um, please do sign in. If you have a question, please feel free to flag it in the doc or um, service that in the chat. We'll be answering those later on. Uh, both of these sessions will be recorded and we'll be making the recording and the notes available um, following these calls on our blog. Um, I know that there were a number of folks who were unable to join us and so we'll have that as an artifact as well. Next, set, next slide, please. Setting some uh, basic ground rules and expectations of, at IOI in terms of how we want to work together. Um, we really firmly believe that we want to have this as a place of, of learning and conversation, and that's how this call is designed as well. So we ask that folks seek to be under, to understand, not to be understood. We're here to learn. Um, be curious. We want to know what thinking this has stimulated. Be helpful. We want to focus on solutions to the problems identified and also be respectful. Um, we aim to build community, not tear it down. Next slide. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague Richard to give us um, some background on COIS before we open it for questions. Richard, to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to give some context for COIS. Uh, we went over some of these in our um, informational session that we did back in January when we launched COIS. Um, but since then, we've released some more uh, documentation and, and every information out there. So um, this is an opportunity just to talk about like, where this came from, why we did this, and we'll be talking some of the features of COIS as I go through this. So the, the primary um, motivation for this was to address information asymmetries, meaning what we heard from people in our interviews and, and kind of casual conversations was just like, well, I really don't know what services are available. Or I'm interested in this type of service, but I don't really know what's there. Um, where can I go to get information about it? And um, so we, we put this catalog together as a way to kind of be that mail order catalog of services, or at least model what that might look like. Um, but not just in terms of features, but also looking at some of the other aspects which were um, flagged to us of, well, how do I know this organization is um, well governed, well run, is financially stable, like all of these things that can get, help people have confidence and trust in, in putting their, their money, their data, their time and effort into these services. So. Um, that was what we, we wanted to, to really try and address with this. Um, and as part of that, too, is help foster greater understanding of open infrastructure services, trying to understand, uh, you know, surface some of the challenges, some of the needs, um, also some of the opportunities as well with, uh, uh, with these services and what they offer um, towards a deeper awareness of how the services are provided. How does this actually get done? Um, how the provider is actually working to, to provide this, um, uh, these, this value to, to users. Um, ultimately, this was uh, intended as a prototype to start off with, a, to look at how we might standardize these key pieces of information. So there was more of a apples to apples-ish kind of comparison uh, when looking at these services, a way to kind of standardize across uh, various different services, doing various different things in various different parts of the world um, in, a, in a way that was meaningful and really meet the needs of various stakeholders. And we're looking uh, at the funders, the providers themselves and users um, we had a good question this morning about um, who is the main uh, stakeholder that we see in this. It is uh, in many ways shaped for the funders needs, knowing what services are out there, what some of those needs are. But we also take we're very mindful of the academic institutions, the institutional budget owners, uh, people at libraries who are, are looking to become users or sponsors of these services. So that they some of this due diligence work that um, can and should be done is done for them. They get this information in a more accessible way. Uh, when looking at different services to, to support their limited resources. Um, we, of course, stand on the shoulders of giants in this work, um, just to name a, a few of them, the, the major works we looked at, the Mapping the Scholarly Communication Landscape Census and Bibliographic Scan, uh, the SCOMCAT catalog, which is very important for us for identifying 
uh, initially some of the, the services that we looked at kind of proofing our, our, particularly in the funding and cost kind of space, which services to look at. Um, the list of open access publishing tools from the Radical Open Access Collective is also a good inspiration. This is all helping us give this information into what services we um, wanted to, to look at, some of the features, nature of these services, the values and principles framework and assessment checklist from the Next Generation Library Publishing Project uh, was very helpful. It informed a lot of the work we were doing. And when we talk about some of the key characteristics of these services and the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, particularly around this uh, being as it is a in a sense, a standard uh, across um, for infrastructure services of around governance and operations and things like that. Um, and we, we took a lot of inspiration from them. And of course, we couldn't get by without mentioning uh, Jerome and Bianca's 400 plus tools, innovations and scholarly communications. Uh, this as well enriched our understanding of some of the, the services that were there, uh, some of the key features of those services when we were selecting our initial cohort of, of services to be in the in COIS. Um, so how we went about doing this work, just to really highlight this, um, we gathered data uh, from provider and funder websites. So providers often will say we get funding from X uh, organization foundation, um, and they will often and, and um, hopefully will do more of disclosures of their governance structures or management structures, personnel, um, and other kinds of things around how they function and operate. Funders as well typically will disclose the funding that they their fundees and how much they funded and when. Uh, so that was a good uh, important source of information for us. We also went through annual reports, both on the funder side and the um, provider side, looking at activities and as well as, as gleaning other information about um, funding sources and, and, and things uh, that they had budgets, things like that. Um, for those organizations that are incorporated in the United States under um, the 501c3 of the US uh, tax code, um, they are required to publish or to submit a Form 990 data. A Form 990, which uh, outlines their revenue and expenses, the personnel involved, their governance activity, governance structures, activities, and things like that. So that was a source of information for us as well, because it is all public data. And we also conducted surveys uh, with providers themselves. So we uh, conducted interviews looking at the hidden costs of providing service infrastructure services. And as part of that, we uh, had them ask them to fill out a pre-interview survey where we had them self-rank um, on certain measures such as uh, staffing uh, types, uh, their funding sources and uh, costs in their budgeting process. And we've uh, included that information into COIS as well to see that represented. Um, so this is COIS, a quick snapshot of it. So um, this is, uh, we have a splash page here. We have um, the, the page here for the service. We have tabs, an overview tab, organization, finances, and delivery tab. The overview gives some basic information in the service summary um, uh, and descriptors about the, the, the service. Organization talks about the people involved and, and a little bit of the history of it and how it's structured. Finances gets into the revenue, uh, costs, net assets, some of those kinds of things. The um, How they're primarily funded is a program service revenue or contributions and gifts. Other kinds of things about the finances, the organization, and delivery gets into the how that service is delivered. Um, the technology being used, number of users, um, and, and things like that, how they foster community. On the overview page, we do have also, well, most of the, the data in here is descriptive. Uh, we do have a few evaluative measures, and this is drawing on the uh, work of COPUM in transformative influence. So how is this service helping advance or reflecting the values and principles of uh, open science? Um, that, you know, that's getting to the, again, the referencing Posey and, and some of the other um, uh, work that's being done on the val on values. And so we we're looking at these uh, criteria around openness, so open code repository, an open data statement, the technical user documentation. So this disclosure piece, the governance structures, is that disclosed? Is that, um, and how is that disclosed? The activities are being, and, and is the activities disclosed? Also looking at accessibility, pricing, and commit to equity and inclusion. So, um, and we have criteria around that's documented into our uh, documentation that we released last week, um, along with the interest survey. Uh, so that can be, you can get a sense of how we made those, those judgments, those evaluative judgments on the service. We also have community engagement. So looking at how these services are engaging community. Uh, this is, uh, we feel very important uh, as we have been told, you know, when you talk about open source software, uh, very similar to open infrastructure, right? It's the value of it's only realized in the context of community. Embedded in community, it's is 
how these services really deliver value, cultivating, growing, sustaining, maintaining community. So when we wanted to look at some measures of that to really assess how well these organizations are looking and, and able to foster community. Uh, again, not as a punitive, we don't know this to be like, you know, a thumbs down on anything the service is doing, but as a, a hopefully a helpful nudge to help them think more about some of these things. And particularly when you're talking about uh, surfacing information of funders, helping sensitize funders to the need to support these types of and, um, programs within this, these services within these organizations, helping them support these efforts. So, um, uh, and again, I, I don't think I've quite mentioned that, um, so this was 10 services that we selected. It was uh, very subjective. We've been using all these sources that we, we uh, used, trying to curate a list of 10 services that would help us um, kind of capture a range of different types of services, both in terms of their structure, financing, operations, and, uh, and what they kind of services they were delivering, also the geographic distribution. So it, uh, be very careful, like we did not exclude, the, the exclusion of any service was not a, a value judgment as to whether one was worthy or not. You know, we got a lot of feedback from people saying like, oh, well, why wasn't X included? Why wasn't Y included? And it's, there was no judgment to say like X was not worthy of it. It was really just, um, the, the, the services we, we, we selected were ones that seemed to kind of fit this, the needs of a prototype in order to evaluate, okay, can we get this data together? Can it be displayed properly? Um, and what are some potential issues and things that we need to think about with this? And we're talking about international services like uh, or CLO. Um, when we think about something focused very much on publishing DOIs like uh, Crossref. So it was, um, and so just to be clear about that. As, a, as what it means to be a prototype. Um, it's a grateful acknowledgments uh, to the project leaders who gave us our time and thoughts. Uh, they have lots of things to do and they graciously gave their time not only to fill out the survey, but to say in the interviews. And then um, we did share the data with them prior to releasing COIS uh, for their feedback. They gave us some really great feedback, really thoughtful feedback on the data we were presenting, corrected a few errors, provided some additional information to us. So. Uh, it was a really helpful and productive conversation, and we really appreciate the time that they gave us uh, for that. Um, also, the institutional leaders, funders uh, that participated in our focus groups as part of this work as well, that told us about their needs and what they were looking for. And we also uh, were able to leverage the expertise of uh, researchers working in the nonprofit management space more broadly, uh, and their kind of knowledge and experience in you know looking at financial data for nonprofits and assessing governance and, and things like that. So. Uh, we really, their, their input was invaluable to our work, and we look to continue all of those relationships moving forward to improve COIS. Uh, and of course, our, our wonderful designer, Allison McCartney, who did a great job kind of creating this for us, um, making it look much better than my original charts and graphs and, and Google Sheets and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're really thankful for her, her, her lending her expertise to it. Uh, so with that, I want to transition to talking about the interest survey. The purpose of the survey is really to help us craft the future of COIS. As I mentioned, uh, it was this is a, a prototype. Um, so our aim in this interest survey is to improve the value, usability, scalability, and overall utility of the application. Uh, we have heard from, from some uh, uh, funders and providers that there is value to this, um, but we want to improve on it. So, okay, you like it, it's cool. How can we make it better? How can we make it usable? How can we really meet a, a need? So that's the, one, the aim of the interest survey is to really assess that and help us uh, plan for that going forward. Um, we're also looking at gathering greater insights into how information could be more usable, valuable, reliable, speaks to the need, and co-develop meaningful measures. So for some of these things, um, you know, we, we, there was feedback this morning about uh, the, the transformative influence, right? How do we get the age and what's the impact of that, things like that. Um, none of this is set in stone. We're looking at improving. So it's, it's an iterative mindset that we're taking to this to, to improve. The ultimate goal of this is to tell a, a true and compelling story about these services. Uh, so that can be well understood by those who are interested in, in supporting and whatever that looks like, have a stake in the success of these services. So we were really looking for co-development, uh, collaboration on these wherever possible to make this better and more meaningful. Um, and our aim too is with this survey is to help us support the transformative influence of open services help create a more equitable, just, accessible infrastructure for all who are involved in this space and this movement. Um, so specifically in this survey, what we're asking 
Um, it's some basic information about the service, including a point of contact that uh, we can reach out to, why services are interested in being included in COIS uh, so that we can, again, refine that value proposition for, for services. Um, and also understanding the data, is it easily available that's out there? Um, knowing that uh, the reporting standards vary, there really aren't any standards, right? There was just kind of a, a common practice around things. Um, so it may or may not be easily available. We wanna know about that. Um, what's the best way to get it to us in an ongoing manner? We want this data to be fresh, as, as fresh as possible um, without being burdensome. So it's not like we're gonna every month be like, hey, we need your bu updated budget data or, <laughs> or user data or whatever else. But you know, what's the best way to do this timed with you know, end of the fiscal year, annual report cycle, those kinds of things, so the data can be, be kept fresh um, for us. And then how we can help in the process. So what is it that, that we can do to help with this, particularly for services that don't have, well, not that I think most services don't have a lot of resources for this kind of activity. So knowing that, what can we do to make it easier, kind of meet in the middle in terms of the effort for this, um, and uh, to, to make it easier for everybody involved. As I've, I've mentioned in the past, um, and we've documented in our blog post about this, th this was a, getting this prototype was a very manual process. The data was very artisanal, as I like to say. Um, and that's not sustainable for us if we want to scale up to a, a larger number of services. So it's, it's really about streamlining this, not only for the service providers, but also for us uh, to make sure that this is a sustainable effort going forward um, and is properly resourced. And then also, uh, just what else would you like us to know about COIS? We've got some great feedback questions about how it is, how is COIS different from, uh, say, the European Open Science Cloud Marketplace or other kinds of resources and indexes there. So that's helping us really clarify the, the why of this and the, the what, so that we can better communicate the story of, of COIS and what we hope to, our aspiration for it. Just to say the um, interest survey will be open until uh, June 20th, but please don't wait. Get the information into us. We really would appreciate it. Um, and we'll be publishing out the results in August 2022. Um, the future work, where we go from here. So we've released a technical conceptual documentation that goes into more detail about the um, transformative influence and the community engagement pieces, as well as some of the, you know, like for every field and there's a descriptor of like, well, this is where this means and these are the values and things like that. So that is available and also open for comments. So HackMD, where we host this as an option, you can highlight and then you can um, add a comment in there about uh, any, or add any questions or anything that you have about it. The interest survey, which is ongoing right now, uh, we had, we've launched it, we launched that last week. We're going to be going back to the various stakeholders that we've talked to and uh, have them work with us on this, like show them what we have, get their feedback on it uh, to help improve it. All of this feeding into a strategy and maintenance plan for COIS that we hope to release um, as well as with the results, including the results of the survey. Uh, so we can kind of ground this, uh, this work into the, the data that we receive from this, uh, the interest survey, the interviews and other information evidence that we gain from this. And then uh, developing some ongoing evaluation measures of COIS with various stakeholders. So user surveys, feedback surveys, you know, a, a way to really make sure that we're um, not only creating value, but sustaining that over time. Um, and as it's, it's interesting to reflect on this, that uh, what we are basically doing in microcosm is developing a service, much like the services that we are uh, including in our catalog. So it's an interesting case of us, you know, the uh, learning by doing in a sense, like what really goes into this and the moving parts of it. So, um, while we hope COIS in of itself has value for the, the community, it definitely has research, has value for us as a um, clarifying exercise in this kind of work. So with that, I'm actually, I'm really excited to open up for questions, any questions that you have. And I will stop the sharing so we can all gaze into each other's eyes and we can go from there, so. Thanks, Richard. you on the spot, Charles. <laughs> no, it's really helpful. Um, a very, very, very good overview. Um, yeah, it's it, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we are suddenly in a space with a lot of work on infrastructure um, and a lot of efforts to define infrastructure. Um, I mean, I, I suppose, as what I, I guess I'm wondering, um, as you gather, I mean, how, how much scaling do you expect to do? I know that's a really hard question. 
uh, with this latest interest survey. So you have this small number of um, sort of things that you work, work through to develop the methodology uh, uh, essentially currently on the catalog site. Um, at the uh, end of this calendar year, say, do you have a sense of how many services you might have? I know that's an impossible question. Well, I'll answer from like a basic technical level. We can, so the, the app, the, the Django app that we had created, built for us by Allison, theoretically could scale to not an infinite number, but there's really no conceivable ceiling. We could do all 400 services in there. Uh, there's some issues when you get to indexing and some of the like uh, structure of it, but in terms of the capacity for the application, we could accommodate a fairly large number of, of services. Um, in terms of uh, how many we're hoping for, we, we'd like this to be comprehensive to comprehensive the extent we can. There is a question in our mind, and it did come up this morning, and I think it's very important um, as we work through well, what, inf what is infrastructure and what should be in here. Uh, I do think it's important to distinguish infrastructure from tools from a feature, you know, and that thinking about, because it, it's important to make that discernment about it. Infrastructure, as we've been discussing, we had a um, preliminary investigation into the literature around infrastructure, what infrastructure is, borrowing from different, looking at different fields on this. Um, you know, it's, it's really about enabling activities and enabling activities in a way that's um, more efficient because it's a shared kind of piece that's, uh, instead of a team developing uh, an approach, it's something that can be used generally by multiple teams or multiple organizations, multiple uh, users in order to achieve the same or similar task. And then within that, when we're touching and talk about in a resource constrained environment, the more critical infrastructure, the more essential infrastructure, things like that, um, that starts drawing some lines that starts becoming concerning for people like who's making those decisions. And we're initiating the conversation around like what does governance look like for that? How we make those decisions. But they, they do need to be made so that resources can hopefully be concentrated where they're, they're really needed. Um, that being said, as I might make the, use the example of Mercutu, it may not have as many, near as many users as Crossref um, or Orchid, but in, it's for those that it does serve, it is a very critical piece of infrastructure, right? It's, it's, it's uh, particularly being a, an underrepresented, underrepresented, underserved group. So for that piece, for that group, it's very critical. Even if in the larger sweep of scientific endeavor or resource quality communication, it may not appear at first blush to be that critical. So we're really having to think about that at different scales, different ways. Also appreciating that when infrastructure is working well, uh, it can tend to uh, be more ubiquitous, less noticeable, less visible uh, for various reasons for why that is, um, but potentially, so it's in a sense, we have to be mindful that what, people may not see something as infrastructure when it really is. And that's partly the function of it just kind of disappears into the background or it's not seen as much or there are people generally speaking aren't as focused on understand fully the, the critical role it plays. So there is a conscious raising, there's an awareness kind of piece to this work as well that's very important, particularly with funders um, as well. So in terms of how many we expect, it's going to depend on the definitions and how we, we we where we set the boundaries for that. Who's going to be in coys? We can technically scale up. Then it's just a question of how much do we actually do, um, and and how the, the structures and everything that we put we put into it, and how hopefully how we can also one of the things we're exploring, thinking about in this strategic plan is um, what opportunities are there for automated data collection? What opportunities are there for um, self serve data uploading and things like that? So that this, if we do end up going to like 500 projects or uh, 500 services, that that can be done in a way that, you know, doesn't require a small army of IOI staff members to maintain. So does that answer your question? I know there's a lot yeah. of things. No, that, no, that's really helpful. And actually your example of Makotu was really helpful because the thing that I was um, wondering about there is the degree to which the catalog starts to become Ca uh, cataloged itself, like ta the taxonomy. Because of that issue of um, there's infrastructure that we all depend on, and then there is infrastructure that certain communities depend on. Um, and how does one uh, identify where in the map of infrastructure things fit? So that was really helpful. Um, 
that's really helpful. Yeah, and then like I said too, like once you start getting to those ontologies um, within that, having some way to uh, index it. So it's like right now it's just basically you have the list of services and you click on it. So adding some search functionality, filtering something like that, if, if for, for things uh, in, in that way, and then also it would be nice. And again, this is very aspirational. Just be very clear. Um, understanding the, the dependencies as well. So knowing that all five of these services are all very much um, tied to this one particular um, platform or whatever. Um, for example, Mercudu is uh, built on built on Symphony, which is built on Drupal. There have been uh, challenges with like the Drupal um, language versions and things like that that have added some extra cost as, as some of those languages go to end of life and everything else and some adjustments on the Symphony platform side, things like that. So those are all costs that Mercudu is having to think about and manage in order to, to keep their platform secure um, and it provide, providing value features, everything else as well. So being able to surface those, particularly when um, not only for existing services, but new services that are coming online that we're exploring that, hey, should we look at Java? Should we look at Drupal? Or what are some of the trade-offs with it? Some of those kinds of things. So um, at least being able to track that and be able to look at that, hopefully that makes more informed decisions. Uh, you know, if you're gonna, if I'm a library that wants to, to use Mercutu, right? Knowing that you're gonna need some support as some kind of plan around hosting this, you know, Drupal service and um, or Drupal software and all those kinds of things. So it's, again, making that, those things that were less visible, more visible for people to make better informed decisions as a goal of this. I also wondered about um, whether a service could drop out of the catalog um, by not meeting, changing and not meeting standards. Sorry, maybe this is watching too much Ted Lasso and thinking about like being a relegation kind of thing, like, <laughs> or Pluto no longer being a planet kind of thing. Right. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that's a good question. And that I think will come up for, you know, in terms of the governance and how we, because we would like this to be community governed to the extent possible. So making those decisions in a, in a collaborative way, I guess my thoughts about that are, I, I guess it really depends on the service. I, I, I would, again, because their infrastructure, I would hope they continue providing their service in some, maybe not perpetuity, but at least in a long-term way. So you know, cross us on the side tomorrow, you know what, this DOI thing's not our bag, we're going to go off and do something else. I don't know, you know, um, because it's, there's an expectation and investment, time, energy, resources into, into this to build it up, to make it work. Um, and that wouldn't go away. So I think that's, that would be, again, a, a question of if there is a pivot, if there's something that changes with it, um, removed from the catalog. One thing I would say, though, is we are focusing on nonprofits in particular and very broadly. So they don't have to be like independent nonprofits, like a, like a five, a registered charity or anything like that. It can be a fiscally sponsored project or institutionally sponsored, like an academic institution. Um, if a service were to go for and somehow be purchased by a for-profit or in some way kind of acquired in that way, and then no longer really be considered open in that sense, I think that's where we would probably look at, some kind of procedures, a process for them evaluating and possibly removing them, you know, saying that, well, you're really no longer open now, like an odds unlatched kind of situation or something. Um, that it, 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 that could see that. So that's probably a more likely scenario than someone pivoting and no longer being really infrastructure. Yeah, I think there's also a real, it's a really great question because we just in a, in a broader sense, because I'm also thinking of projects that may sunset right? And how we might want to flag that a project, you know, did serve this community. Um, there might be a migration piece that we want to highlight there. I know that um, to Richard's point about looking at some of the technical dependencies, there's also some really interesting um, work out of the computational science and assessment space about even looking at how vibrant based on like a GitHub repository and what that means in terms of risk and fragility, like how many contributors are there, how many issues are surfaced, how, what's the time in terms of someone resolving an issue and what have you. And so you can see if something, get a little bit more granularity regarding, you know, is there a contributor base um, or people actively managing and maintaining that piece of work where you can seek support. 
but there's also some questions there also around um, what that kind of sunsetting piece of the puzzle looks like and how we might want to flag that. Um, I know that there were some initial comments uh, when we and when we kind of rolled out COIS and we went through not only approval and in sharing of this work with our steering committee, but also with, again, other stakeholders, um, even about, I remember it was about the uh, DOI foundation, right? About them not being open enough in comparison to others. And that was where that initial dialogue about understanding the dependencies, because there's a lot of interesting elements um, around the DOI foundation that just by looking at ORCID and Crossref sort of led our investigation to, and it was an opportunity for us to have a, a dialogue with the project lead who was, you know, the managing, uh, the managing agent there was extremely forthcoming about helping us better understand that landscape. And so while I do think that there's, it's a great question to continue to revisit, not only in terms of what that criteria is, what those circumstances are and the governance, but also that bigger question of um, what degree of openness or alignment are we looking to put forward? And I think having the diversity there is important, but we probably um, do want to just continue to see what that feedback looks like and, and where that can be of benefit. Because mm. uh, that sort of issue of auditing, I mean, just keeping yeah. up um, is is challenging, isn't it? And it, I, I, I mean, as I'm trying to think about, you know, what you're trying to do, I mean, um, it is interesting to think about the directory of open access journals and um, particularly in, and the uh, the way in which there's a um, there's a, a an imprimatur, right? Um, and uh, open stores uh, to those journals. Um, such as you can get switched on in ex libris and then you, you know, and then the data flows um but then the question comes up um you know what if the practices of a particular journal change is there an auditing me mechanism it's true of the association of university presses as well you can it's quite complicated to get in but once you're in things can change a lot and then is there a process for revisiting um and sort of checking so um if if I am I so is that a reasonable kind of frame in which potentially to understand the um, the COIS as a kind of a, a DOAJ for infrastructure? I hadn't thought about that, but that's a really interesting way to view it. I think that there's um, there's elements of that. I would say mixed also. I mean, we we think of kind of drawing some inspiration from um, from other external spaces in terms of like if you were to want to invest in a different stock, like what is your morning star report? So it's kind of to me, I think that there are attributes of all of those that come together in this. Um, I mean, and frankly, in the future open scholarship work, we heard from so many different library leaders that were trying their best under immense time and budget pressures to still move forward values aligned decisions, but it realizing that they were doing the same sort of due diligence that their peers were and spending time and then doing the case making like, and that it just became additionally onerous. Um, and also that there wasn't something that they could point to outside of their institution to say, here's, you know, here's what's recommended, that there was a benefit there too. So I think that's a, it's a really, I'm gonna have to chew on that for a little longer because I think that that's a really interesting, um, an interesting example in terms of a DOH for infrastructure with additional financial stuff and like analysis and risk and stuff like that too. But then again, I think that there are probably elements of the metadata that are within DOHA that could also kind of serve that purpose for different choice choices. Yeah, I would say in so far as, you know, being compared in a you know side by side or with a similar kind of thing is very helpful to uh, have some kind of standardization uh, at least of evaluation and then i think there is a incentive then and we've seen that from some of the providers when we with the transformative influencers a certain incentive to to be seen a certain way and that can can um nudge some actions some activities can be very helpful um and particularly for those criteria and things you know 
for example, right, if, if a journal wanting to go into DOAJ hadn't really thought about um, how the author retains copyright, and now they're being asked that question now, okay, oh yeah, we didn't think about that now. And that's kind of what we've seen already with the providers is, oh, we hadn't thought about like a web accessibility statement. Well, okay, let's look into that or think about it, right, or something like that. So um, it's definitely having in the same way kind of some impact. It is indexing, it is surface information, has a uh, measurement effect. Um, the one thing, and it's kind of again speaks to, again, some of the gatekeeping and, and evaluative kind of pieces is because we want to, and I say the DOAJ doesn't, I don't want to say that, but like part of this also is helping build up the community in a way. So we were very mindful, for example, of not listing the competitors in there. We thought about that originally, like, oh, we'll add, who else is doing the same kind of preprint service, or whatever. And it's like, mm, that doesn't feel quite right. It should really be telling that story in exclusion. So that there isn't an incentive, oh, let me go check out their competitors and like, especially the for profits or whatever. It's like, we don't, we don't want to get into that kind of piece. We want to help build a community up and again, tell those stories. So, um, so yeah, but it's a good point. And I think it's definitely worth us thinking about more. So thanks for sharing that. Well, it, I, I didn't think it was, uh, I mean, no, this is really helpful. I mean, it's uh, um, the, um, I suppose the, yeah, I, I, I mean, your point about this uh, being an initiative to shift uh, uh, to actually, you know, uh, shape behavior uh, and um, spot, uh, identify gaps, right? I think that's really good. I mean, to, um, it's a, this is an interesting timing for me because tomorrow we'll go into our third It Takes a Village assessment for Fulcrum. So we've been checking in every now and then. Um, and... Uh, you know, just looking at your list on the um, on the uh, questionnaire, expression of interest. Uh, you know, you've clearly got this kind of there's a balanced score, scorecard sort of thing happening, which is very closely related to the sustainability questions, and it takes a village. So your focus on community engagement, finance, technology, and governance is very very similar, um, and. I guess what's interesting is maybe there's at the moment a little bit more flexibility potentially in it takes a village. So for example, we've recognized governance as, a, as an issue, um, but we've sort of settled on the idea that maybe it's okay to be a University of Michigan thing. Um, so we've wrestled with that. Like, is it time to establish a board and create a, an external and broadly based group of stakeholders to actually have a formal role in governance and then we've wrestled with the fact that that would be a large overhead for us and that overhead would take away from some of the other things we could do and so we've come to a sort of agreement uh, that that's okay that um, as long as the governance within the University of Michigan is strong enough to stabilize keep us stable maybe it's okay not to have a distributed governance um, and I'm just wondering if that would still fit with the invest in over, uh, an open infrastructure framework. I mean, is that kind of decision, as it were, acceptable to potentially be in COIS? Co co uh, COIS? Yes. <laughs> and, and that's okay. something that we, we were talking about this. because we, we were doing this kind of work. It was right after the Knowledge Unlatched. And so in, there's a question, and there's some, some of the services we talked to they're probably they're in the same similar situation. They're probably never going to go as an independent nonprofit. They're going to stay in their academic institutions or, or for various reasons. So it's less important, I think, to say we don't want to be prescriptive and say you must do X, Y, and Z, right? But it's to elevate the conversation and just name it like you are doing X, and because right. you're doing X, there are costs and benefits to it. There's also Y and Z, and there's the cost benefits there, and you might think about it. And then also understanding that there is a spectrum here too. So like, for example, for IOI, right? We, we don't have a, because we aren't independent nonprofit, we don't have a board or we don't have to, we're legally obligated to have a board. And yet we have some of those structures. So we've adapted them to our situation to get some of the benefits, even though we don't, we're not under that obligation for it. So um, being creative with this, I think is definitely allowable and what we want to see. Um, and if we need to create more categories for things, we can. Uh, in this kind of space, but at least naming things as this is what you're doing. Um, right. And again, this part of that storytelling, 
as long as it's in line with the the values, right? So then if it's like, well, we're going to do this and we're going to monetize and we're going to sell people's data and we're going to be <laughs> a prop or something like that, right? So it's like within the boundaries of like the values of openness and transparency and good governance and things like that. But within that, definitely want to encourage as much innovation and right sizing for the organization in terms of their structure, culture, mission, vision, strategy, all those kinds of things. But mm -hmm. at least leveling up the you know, uh, leveling up the conversation about it. So there's more context and thoughtfulness and evidence and things that feed into that. Yeah. And I think there's also a really interesting point there and also getting back to sort of some of the the auditing kind of questions there too. Um, and in terms of that maintenance plan, really I know we initially kind of dedicated a like we will revisit these annually so that we can make sure that the data that we're having, I mean, that also aligns with say when 990 information is made available and updated and stuff like that. Um, but also said that, you know, to the best of our abilities, if something changes um, for a project, they can flag that to us and we can push that change. I think it's also really important to note that, you know, the work of COIS, I mean, this came up in, in conversation of, the information that we're surfacing, and if you, even if you look at sort of the um, the amount of, I mean, we have information from the 990s that could surface information not only about assets and liabilities, about loans, about dependency on certain types of funding, right? So, like, let's say you were to compare Crossref with um, or Orchid with. Uh, the Center for Open Science. There are very different funding dependencies there. I think where IOI's work and the team that Richard is building out um, in addition to COIS, and it might be something that we further situate within COIS, but this also might be something that sits alongside, um, understanding that the context is so key in terms of understanding you know, what levels or thresholds for um, for risk or for opportunity or for resourcing an organization may have. Um, and when we interpret funders in like a broader sense of not just thinking like philanthropy and government, but also institutional budget owners, people who are investing in that work, but there may be a different risk tolerance. They may have different support staff. Um, they may need something completely out of the box. Um, they may have different technical uh, expertise available where they might need to look at certain elements. And so, you know, it might be something where they could take more of um, you know, a risk on something that might have maybe one income stream, um, but they might have the technical staff there to help move it forward versus looking at a diversified element. And so those sorts of things started to surface as you know, really not wanting to get into a place where we're saying that one thing is right, one thing is wrong. I mean, everyone has opinions, but also um, presenting the information so that we can then start to kind of do the testing to say, okay, what sort of additional analysis is useful like again the, the example of a morningstar report they make recommendations they say you know this this actually presents different sort of um indicators and that's where which i think is really fascinating about this work charles is um richard has and the team have also reached out to and started to situate and bring into our work others in the nonprofit effectiveness and management space. And so some of those standardizing, I mean, we are not the first groups to do this. Um, and so really looking at when um, we're looking at some of the sort of indicators about how to flag, you know, financial risk or organizational health, where there are places we can learn from, from outside of the sector to bring that in. Um, but for the first prototype, we really wanted to get an example out that was 100% verifiable, you know, not a subjective piece of information, but um, an interesting place to explore about how that work evolves either within COIS or alongside. Yeah, yeah, I can see that as this gets uh, down into these slightly less obvious, as it were, or slightly more niche infrastructure providers, it is going to get a little bit more complicated. I mean, it's just thinking about 990s. I mean, so if one was to try and do a 990 on Michigan, on you know, Fulcrum, I was just looking at the, the Michigan website actually, and it actually no longer does a 990, which is very cheeky. It says it's not required to file, uh, a, a, as a government entity, it's not required to file form 990, although it was doing until quite recently. So it's interesting. Maybe, maybe your endowment took you out of that, <laughs> out of that state. And also, of course, that wouldn't reflect the, the, the uh, sadly, <laughs> sadly, 100%. the stability of Fulcrum. Um, okay, well, this is really, really helpful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you got it. it. You got it. Um, if you have any additional questions, you know, we're 
happy to stay along. Um, also, please feel free to reach out to us at any time too. That is really great. Thank you very much indeed. This is super. Oh, well, I have, have a great night and enjoy your It Takes a Village assessment tomorrow. We'll be very excited to see how Fulcrum comes out on the other side. Well, thank Before you we do that, much. though, would you mind, and it was not going to be an honest talk, would you mind we have a quick, like, post-survey? That's and right. Yes. Up really quick yes. And we'll thank you, Richard, for reminding me that. How many so. times shall I complete it? <laughs> well, just once. It'll only let you do it once. Oh, do some oh. sad. But okay. Unfortunately, it's not very anonymous right now. You, you, so. yes, you, yeah, you, you we'll know. You, you won't be able to work out who I am. Wait a second. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, very oh. good indeed. Uh, I, I was engaged. I really felt engaged. Yep, we've <laughs> addressed those. Uh, yep, I very much agree. Okay. Be open and honest with us. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's fives all the way down. Okay. Uh, thanks so Thank much. You so much. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.